Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us John Shigarian, who's the co-founder and CEO of ERI. John, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mike. It's an honor to be here. Yes, I'm looking forward to talking with you. And I know uh, um, you, you've got a storied past, and I want to hear all about what you've learned all the way through uh, your your career, because I know that each time you do something, we as humans and business people do something, you learn a little bit, you improve, yeah. and then you make it better. And so I want to hear all about that. So give us a little bit of your entrepreneurial background. Yeah, well, I, my, my mom was a social worker, and my dad was a serial entrepreneur. So you put them both together and, you know, you look back and you realize, how did I even get here? Well, you put an entrepreneur and social entre- and a social worker together and you get a social entrepreneur. And that's yeah. pretty much been my journey. There was never even such a thing, uh, you know, but I just started doing those kind of things. And I got very lucky in life. I, I started taking care of racehorses as a child and uh, became very involved with that industry and learned what it took to take care of expensive investments, uh, raise capital, um, you know, be self-disciplined in terms of my professional demeanor as a teenager. And that carried over to my uh, adult life. And um, I went to college, got educated, married a really good woman, and I've been married to her for 37 years. And um, and then off we went to the races and I became a a real estate developer. Then I co-founded Homeboy Tortillas, which became Homeboy Industries with Father Greg Boyle during the Rodney King riots, after the Rodney King riots, hit LA. And then from there on in, my wife and I decided we learned from that that we never wanted to do any more business ventures that um, only made money. We wanted to Mm. make money and make a difference in everything we did. So we went on to to co-found financialaid.com in 1998, which was the year Google was founded. And uh, that became the largest student lending company in the United States after every venture capitalist that I can meet threw me out of their office. And we had to self-fund that and also Mm. raise a little money from some local entrepreneurs here in Central California. And that became a big success. And then from there, we built on that. And the next next company that I I started, a bunch of companies that are still going, but one that I started that really is... uh, has made another big impact is ERI. And ERI is Electronic Recyclers International. And I started that with uh, three partners. One is my wife, one is Aaron Blum, and the the fourth one is Kevin Dillon. And uh, Kevin was with me at financialaid.com and uh, was my chief marketing officer there. And um, we've been running that for 20 years. And it's now the largest electronic waste and recycling company and hardware data destruction company in North America. Wow. So if I were a fly on the wall at each of those three uh, companies you mentioned, and, and I know you mentioned more uh, yeah, that you did more, yeah, but yeah, yeah. tortillas yeah. to financial aid yeah. to electronic waste. Yeah. What's the what's the recurring thread there? Why, yeah. How did you come up when you're doing tortillas? How did you come up with let's launch into financial aid? And when you were doing that, how did you think, yeah. hey, e-waste? What, what was the um, the genesis there? Yeah, it's a great question because they're all varied. And I'm a huge believer in doing businesses that you are that a here's the real algorithm. There's got to be a white space. You got to figure out, can you do you have a solution for it? Yeah. Is the solution scalable? And on a and on a scalable level, is it, is it profitable? Is it not only scalable, but is it commercializable? Is there a marketplace for it, even though you could scale it? And then what you got to come up with, and here's the here's the kicker. There's a lot of businesses, I, there's a lot of white space out there that I, I, I think about all the time. That's sort of the, the x-ray vision of an entrepreneur. They're always thinking about yeah. voids and white spaces, but... The last one is the the kicker is that it's got to be personal to you yep. because because that way you, you get excited. Fight. You get excited every morning, Mike, and you fight through all the wars that happen along the way because the wars are going to happen. The, 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 the near deaths are going to happen. 
And you ha- it has to be so personal that you're going to fight through it and not let they, it won't let it's that personal uh, spirit in it will not let you give up on the dream. And that's really the kicker. Yeah, you know, you, you think about, um, you know, what goals uh, do you want to set for yourself? And then you push, push, push yourself to meet them. But if you set them the right way, they right. draw you toward achieving them. And that's what you just said there. You know, you, the mark of a true entrepreneur is you pick something that, you know, has you know, white space, teeth, profit, scalable, all of that. But then at the end of the day, you better have fun doing it so that, uh, you know, it doesn't feel like a drudgery. So what was it about e-waste that made yeah. you get so excited? And one last angle on it from my wife and I, and this doesn't have to go for every entrepreneur, but it's not only got to be personal, but it also has to make an impact. It has to make a positive yeah. impact in either our community or the planet. So yeah. financial aid, we democratize student lending. At ERI, we solve the issue, not solve, but we help create oh we saw the white space there being e-waste back in 2002 like was the fastest growing solid waste stream in the world well here's the great news and here's the bad news the great news is we figured out a solution we professionalized a solution the solution used to be just scrap yards or dumping it into landfills or dumping it into uh neighboring countries countries in asia india africa etc Mexico even, but we came up with a domestic solution. They kept it out of landfills. They kept us from dumping it into our neighboring countries and our friendly countries around the world in other emerging economies. And it also didn't pollute the environment when we created the solution and it made the world a better and greener place. So that's the good news. Here's the bad news. Electronics since 2002. Now remember, 2002 doesn't sound that long ago. But there was before there was an iPhone, before there was an iPad, before drones became ubiquitous to our lexicon. So here's what happened. Cars became, automobiles became computers on wheels. Our white goods started having also hard drives in them. The Internet of Things came up. So think about all the gadgets, the wearables that we have and the stuff that we have in our home. Nest, Ring, all the Echoes everything that surrounds us that's now electronics. So the ubiquity of electronics have now created an issue where electronics are not only the fastest growing solid waste stream in the world, they're the fastest growing solid waste stream by an order of magnitude of two to four times the second fastest growing solid waste stream. So the problem has expanded, even though legitimate and responsible solutions have been created. So, I, and I can envision that, like you said, 2002 to now 20 years uh, has gone by and look at all the things we've got from your fridge can reorder food for you when you're, yeah, right. it's, right. it's unbelievable. So I know that you can't just go, oh, hey, my um, laptop uh, uh, went bad. So I got a new laptop. I'm just going to throw my old one in the trash can. Right. But right. We know, we know we can't do that. But, but my question is, if it is so vast, um, Wow. You, you need 10 or 20 or 30 of you, or you need to scale 10 or 20 or 30 times. What's the, what's the vision for making sure you're meeting the demand for what's out there? Great question. So we opened up, we first, when we opened the business, Mike, we thought we were going to have a nice California Central Valley based business out of Fresno, California. And we were very happy. Our first month of business, we recycled 10,000 pounds of electronic waste, April of 2002. but You fast forward 20 years later, this last April of 2022, we recycled 20 million pounds. Mm -hmm. So um, we just opened up our ninth location across the United States in uh, Goodyear, Arizona. And now we're looking for our 10th location. We're also looking for locations around the world as well. We will be opening up in Europe, eventually South America and in Asia. And we have partner companies that we work with around the world. So yes, we have to we have to uh, increase our capacity and yes, the demand is greater than ever. And here's a sad statistic from the United Nations. Only 17%, Mike, of all electronics that are sold and used on the planet are being responsibly recycled when they come to the end of life. So, if other entrepreneurs are listening to this show, which I know they are, or other people thinking of, "Oh, every idea has been done. I wish I had an idea that I could do that has a lot of upside." There's 83% delta of opportunity in in responsibly recycling e-waste for people to do. 
That's why we're still excited. We still think it's the top of the second inning. And that's why dozens and dozens upon dozens of entrepreneurs around the world can still get involved in this industry and do very, very well. And so you say that only you know, a small percentage, a sliver yep. of businesses are yep. responsibly uh, recycling properly. What are some of the things that could be done to proactively do this? Not just like, oh, well, we better fix what we've done. But what are some of those steps that you're recommending? Well, in terms of there needs to be more legislation banning electronics from landfills. We only have legislation in about 25 states of the United States. In 25 states, you can still throw it into a landfill. That's just a shame. That's just irresponsible and a shame, number one. Number two, there needs to be more education. More people have to understand two things. You don't want to throw away your old laptop or cell phone or hard drive or anything electronic in the trash. Why? Number one, environmentally, it's irresponsible because most electronics have lead, beryllium, cadmium, mercury, arsenic, some, some hazardous material in it that will leach into the landfill, water supply, ground supply, and eventually make it back into plants, animals, and human beings. That's horrible and bad, environmentally speaking, and for the planet. Number two, something that happened during the last 20 years, Mike, cybersecurity was not part of our vernacular 20 years ago. It now is, of course, a huge, huge trend on the planet, protecting our businesses, our organizations, and our families from the cyber criminals is a big deal. Part of that discussion is the hardware side of it. The software side of it has gotten all the media attention. But if you dispose of your old hardware and electronics inappropriately, even if it's on a benign basis, without knowledge, without thinking about it, the cyber criminals could get access and do gain access on many occasions to your old hardware, and then they can reverse engineer your entire life. All your bank accounts, your social security, and everything. And this goes for Huge corporations, small corporations, nonprofit, publicly traded companies, and just the man and woman on the street, just with their own household and their own family. We service all these kind of organizations around the United States and around the world. And the stories that we have and that I can tell you, Mike, are just horrific. So prevent a catastrophe by responsibly recycling your old hardware when it comes to its old, when it comes to its end of life. So I, I like that you put in there, um, you know, we should be responsible. And I think a lot of people are, but then many people are not. Yep. But when you put in there the fact that, ooh, it could affect you personally. Yep. Th that really is a, a thing, right? You know, identity theft right. and all of that. So that's a big thing. Um, so then so then you're a big, big uh, um, corporation. If someone is listening to this going, okay, well, I do need to recycle this. Do they have to find one of your locations or then where do they go to take these? Great question. There's many. The great news is that we have about 10,000 drop-off points around the United States you, through other partnerships. So Salvation mm -hmm. Army is a partner. You drop it off at Salvation Army. You know they use a responsible recycler. They use us. Drop it off at Best Buy. They choose only vendors like us. We're one of them. We're one of three that they that they chose that when you drop off at a Best Buy location, it gets responsibly recycled and, and the information gets destroyed. Same thing with Staples and many other great brands. These drop off locations around the United States just make sure they're using a responsible recycler. We're not the only company. There's dozens of other great companies that do great work and um and and these and and if you're dropping it off at your local city or municipality, just ask the question: Who are they using for to do the recycling? It's important, and if they can't be transparent about it, don't drop it off there. Wait till you find the place that can be transparent about who the vendor is that's doing the responsible recycling of your old hardware. I love it. Well, it's just such a. You know, you, you hear about, um, you know, vision and mission, and I'm certain that you've got just a clearly articulated vision and mission for your company. And I also uh, love the word crusade. So it's yeah. almost like, you know, a, vis a crusade takes it, you know, to grabs the vision and mission and puts it in the backpack and starts marching down the street and goes, come on, let's go follow me. So I just love the crusade that you're on. And yeah. it's something that is very needed. Like you said, it's something that betters the world. And so I I really applaud everything you're doing. What's a, what's a final thought uh, that you would like to express? And then what's the best way people can learn more about your business? Yeah, uh, this is going to be a growing industry. It's a growing problem. 
So just responsibly take care of the planet and take care of your family and the organization you work with by responsibly recycling your electronics. It doesn't have to come to our company. And you can find our company at www.eridirect.com. I also wrote a book called The Insecurity of Everything. It's It sells on Amazon and it became an Amazon bestseller. But for your listeners, Mike, I offer this book for free. So if they want to write to you or they want to write to me personally and say they, they heard me, on your great podcast, um, then I am very, very happy to give them a send them free of cost the book for free, the mailing for free. So they just have to give me their 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 mailing address, and I will send them their own copy of the insecurity of everything. In that book is much of what we've covered on this podcast and a lot more. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on. It was a true pleasure talking with you. Honor to be here today, Mike. Continued success with your great podcast. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.